So what I plan to do is give a really brief summary of what we've done, you know, that kind of goes over the stuff you've probably already read in the videos, and then update you to the steps we're at right now. And this should only take about 20 minutes. And I look forward to afterwards, you know, asking you what you think, how you might participate and sharing ideas. So I'm uh, gonna start. Let's see how we move forward here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I don't think I need to explain why we need alternative cooking technologies. If you're here, you already know. And likely, we also understand that solar cooking has is really effective. It works great. It's very inexpensive. And yet people don't adopt it. And some of the reasons are, you know, people don't want to cook outside. People do want to cook after dark. People want more power. And so when I first expressed to a friend that I was interested in solar cooking, um, he laughed in my face and I thought, wow, you know, this guy's my friend. And, and there must be real problems with this. And so what I say now, rather than I'm developing solar cooking, is that we're developing a solar cooking technology that'll fail for a different reason, for not these same three reasons. And so for a while, we looked with these big concentrators, these Scheffler concentrators that are 2000 watts, and they're, they're just great. And you can, um, you can actually focus the light into a house, right? And we began to make them, them um, cheaper, and we said, okay, what if we make them like surfboards? We get a plug and we put fiberglass down and we coat them. And so we were making them pretty nicely, but I had to ask myself, you know, I would never have used that. There, and so why wouldn't I use it? Um, for any number of reasons. But again, I looked at this, or at the same time, we saw how cheap solar panels got. And right before 2020, they dropped below uh, 20 cents a watt or $20 for a 100 watt panel at the factory door. And so right now, I think in India, you can buy a 100 watt solar panel for about $50. And so I was like, well, why don't we just connect a resistive heater to a solar panel and heat our food? We know that at 100 watts, we can boil one liter of water per hour but we need to insulate it because it'll never get hot if we don't. And so this made a difference for me. I began cooking my food at home like this. And we began working with other people. We sent a group to Uganda. And here you see they use natural insulation, which is dicey because it can start on fire and they made their own heater with nichrome wire inside of a piece of mortar. And the two that we deployed, it was only two. They loved it, but they said, we want more power, we want to cook after dark, we want to charge batteries. And so the model was, we changed the model. Initially, it was a solar panel connected directly to a heater to heat your food over the course of the day. But then we said, look, rather than heat the food, Let's store the heat in a thermal battery. And what we used was uh, erythritol. It's a um, sugar alcohol that melts at 118 Celsius. And so throughout the day, we would store the heat by melting it. And then you could put a pot in there and cook it or put your food directly in the ISEC, uh, directly in this uh, phase change assembly. And this really changed my life. So I began cooking every day. Uh, it was very conveniently located in my kitchen where I cook. The wires came down from a solar panel on the roof. It was always hot. I could use it almost like a microwave oven. I knew that if I just threw food in, it would get hot right away. There were no moving parts. There was nothing for me to maintain. And it's pretty inexpensive. And so I cooked all different kinds of food and still do. And we also looked at, you know, this is big and bulky. Um, this one. And we also looked at what if we put it in a vacuum flask, this double walled stainless steel. And, uh, you know, this works pretty well. But one of the things we found is the, the insulation isn't what it could be. And it could just be that the one the vacuum flask that we used 
is not really good. Um, but vacuum flasks are going to work better for low temperatures and for high because you need a really good vacuum. And as soon as you dump something hot in there or you heat it up, um, you're going to evaporate. You're going to boil off oils and stuff off the wall. And so you're going to lose your vacuum. So it's not clear why these don't work so well. So in any case, our dissemination, how are we going to get people to use these or how are we going to share this with the world? And what we have is we have nine people globally or nine small enterprises that we're collaborating with. And uh, we have a construction manual and a forum, which I'm going to show you a little bit about. And we have weekly meetings. And so the reason we're looking at local manufacturing and dissemination rather than, you know, working with a big plant in, uh, in China is that, you know, people in low income communities uh, will, will work cheaper. And with this diverse set of resources and cultural preferences, we're getting a wealth of ideas. Also, we have some funding. And rather than support a factory, we're supporting low income communities. And we hope that this will also build uh, a, a library of knowledge in low income communities, both so that they can service subsequent cookers and because it stimulates education in places where it may not be. And so here we have one of our weekly supergroup meetings with uh, people from uh, you know, all the different collaborators. I've also involved about 200 Cal Poly students in this over the past six years. Uh, research students, students doing research over the summer, um, student groups that are addressing uh, design challenges, and a lot of uh, service learning classes where groups of students engage with our collaborators. And so this is just one group that is working with Hawazin in India, and they learn about Kerala, India, and the foods, and they document their technical um, ideas and progress. So we publish this model. Hopefully you've seen the publication. Um, here is uh, some excerpts from the construction manual, how we, um, we take a piece of an electric heating element and cut it and connect it and insulate it. This is the one in my kitchen. And so we have this, this construction manual that we're constantly updating. But one of the groups that is partnering with Alexis at Living Energy Farms, and Living Energy Farms is in Virginia, but they work in Jamaica. So Alexis was great. He's an innovator. And when I met him, he said, I think ISEC is great, but you're making them all wrong. And I was like, wow, this is great. So, you know, teach me. And so he built his own construction manual with a different method. And he said, the reason I like this method is we use only locally available materials, stuff that we can get in Jamaica. So he makes his own heater. And rather than insulate with uh, fiberglass, he insulates with perlite, which you can get in Jamaica. And what I was really surprised is one of the other collaborators said, I'm not going to use your construction manual anymore, Pete. I'm going to go with, with uh, Alexis's because we can get the resources that he's using there. And so this was a big victory, I thought, for uh, the learning community model. And so Alexis sent me one of his devices. Here it is, just a regular bucket with a bunch of insulation on the top. He uses this very high temperature fabric and there's a stainless steel pot inside. When you pull the pot out, you can see his very um, inexpensive and effective radiant heater and sunk in uh, mortar. And so, you know, this is kind of where we left off. Now we look at challenges. What we found is we can't continue using ethanol, uh, um, pardon me, erythritol. Over a period of three or four months, it degrades to the point that um, its melting temperature is no longer above the boiling temperature of water. So cooking in it is compromised. <laughs> also, we recognize there's a timer on our technology. 
is batteries are getting cheaper every year and maybe we have 10 or 20 years, but that's okay, right? Because after 20 years, batteries are going to be very cheap and people will store their energy in batteries probably rather than a thermal battery. And so we're looking at where do we wanna go from here? And so we look to Sun Buckets is um, a company that they take these, it looks like it's about a thousand watts concentrator and they have this bucket of nitrate salt for a phase change material. It gets very hot. And then they pull this off. They turn it upside down and you can cook on it. And I've been looking for information on that. And actually, there's a really great thesis written by Matthew Alonzo from 2018. And he shows here the temperature of the PCM and the temperature of water as he boils one kilogram after the other of water. And we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. It looks like 10 kilograms of water that he could boil in an hour and a half. But he also said, what if I just have a big chunk of aluminum? And although sodium nitrate holds more energy, aluminum does pretty well. And he documents the power, you know, we're talking 2000 watts is the rate at which thermal power can come from this aluminum block. And so we can look at a whole bunch of different phase change materials or just thermal storage with a single monolithic chunk of aluminum. And we see aluminum isn't as good as sodium nitrate, but it's pretty good. And also aluminum is pretty inexpensive. For the seven kilograms we have need for a kilowatt hour of storage, um, or maybe half a kilowatt hour of storage, I'm sorry. It would, um, it would cost only $21 if we bought them from Alibaba, but potentially cheaper in Ghana where they mine and process aluminum. Let's see, how do we move down here? And so the idea is maybe we would just have a thermal storage assembly inside of a vacuum vessel or um, you know any other vessel that is insulated. And we heat it up and then when it's hot, we could put a cook pot in there and we could actually insulate over the cook pot, for instance. So there's a couple other models we're exploring. But the first thing was, well, look, we've got this great um, ISEC from Alexis and we just threw a 2.6 kilogram puck, a one liter puck of aluminum in there and heated it up. This was yesterday. And uh, here's Martin after we heated up to about 250 and he puts a pot of water in there. And actually, Martin hasn't even seen the data until now. I just processed it and we see it didn't work really well. What we can see is we heated up the aluminum block. It got to 250 and we had to run out. So we turned it off. It heated up again and um, then we opened it up and we put in one kilogram of water. There seems to be a thermal conductivity challenge between the water and the aluminum they're not meeting really well but i'm very happy we got the water close to a boil that's our first try and we'll move on from here i have six students going to work on this full time over the summer and i'm excited to what happens so i'm not going to give you final thoughts and conclusions because that's why we're here to get those from you i'll just give you my intermediate thoughts we might have thermal storage will be dominant for maybe a little over 10 years until we move to batteries. Nitrate salts are great to replace erythritol, but metals are so simple and maybe that's where we'll start. So we're not sure what to do next and we're not sure it's gonna work. It's kind of scary, but a little exciting. And I wanna know what do you all think? Thanks. Thank you, Pete. That's a quick one. <laughs> well, it was meant to be quick, yeah. right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking yes. to share. Yes, you can either raise your hand or raise your voice or send a question uh, on the chat.